host and moderator for this uh, last panel, Government-led civic technologies, success and challenges. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to join our discussion uh, in this session. And uh, our topic is regarding uh, government-led uh, civil tech. Uh, and you know, the, today our speakers will share with you uh, the projects they are uh, running and uh, what is the success factor and uh, disadvantage uh, for uh, the failures. So uh, uh, we are so glad to have uh, four speakers and the only gentleman, <laughs> Thomas. Uh, Tem yeah, Thomas from, uh, from uh, Amsterdam. And uh, today our topic is regarding uh, government-led uh, projects. And uh, four of our uh, panels, you know, the only one is Sarah. White uh, is the only one from the civil tech, uh, a civil tech society, and the other three uh, currently uh, they are working with government. So it will be very interesting uh, to have them share uh, their projects uh, with uh, with us. So let us starting with uh, the first speaker, uh, Sarah White, please. From uh, I will introduce you. Sarah, uh, Sarah is the program and partnership manager at Code for America. Uh, and uh, uh, at Code for America, Sarah lead government partnership for one of the uh, co products. And uh, uh, prior to joining Code for uh, America, Sarah managed an uh, innovation lab at the University of uh, California, Berkeley. Uh, so let us welcome Sarah. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for sticking around for the last panel. I'm going to stand up here um, so I can see my slides. Um, and thank you so much for the warm introduction. Again, my name is Sarah White. I'm a program and partnerships manager with Code for America. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, although I'm guessing many of you are, we are a nonprofit organization in San Francisco, California, focusing on improving access to government services. Um, we do so um, by partnering predominantly with local government, so that most often means um, cities, counties, um, and sometimes states. Um, so I wanted to share um, one of the projects that I've been involved in. Um, it's called Clear My Record. It's a free online um, multi-jurisdictional application and communication tool for accessing criminal record clearance opportunities in the state of California. Um, just to provide a little bit of context um, into why we developed this product um, and why it's important. Um, some of you may know this, one in four U.S. adults have a criminal conviction, um, the vast majority of which are low-level, um, non-violent crimes. Um, this is important because um, having a criminal conviction can create a lot of barriers um, to accessing um, lots of things like education, student loans, employment. Um, many careers in the United States requiring licenses make it very difficult for you to obtain a license to become a nurse, um, to become a teacher, um, to serve as a real estate agent, many different things if you um, have a, a, a criminal history. Um, so we have been working um, with 12 different, or 13 I should say, different um, California counties to develop um, Clear My Record, which, um, like I said, it's a free online tool. Um, we've been working over the past year and a half to improve what has otherwise been a largely in-person and paper-based process to serve as a nice, glossy, as you can see here, 10-minute um, online application and actually communication tool so that folks, um, you can imagine, that might have one or two convictions across one or two counties can actually apply in one place using user-friendly language, free of legalese and government jargon, often found in forms. Um, and then from there, actually begin to communicate with their attorney via email and text so they can understand what their eligibility is, 
what their options might be, um, and actually how to navigate through the rest of the process. Um, so when I was reflecting on um, this panel, again, Code for America is exterior to government. I am the lone wolf um, in that regard on this panel. But I was thinking um, more about what are some of the ingredients um, or practices that, that we've learned at Code for America through our work on how to effectively design civic technology. And I think that these are lessons that um, can be shared and I've seen them happen through government-led technologies as well. Um, some of the things that we've seen um, in our progress with Kermay Record, um, we have increased um, the folks that, that counties are actually able to serve by about 68%, still, by, um, still while reducing processing time for about four weeks. And that's really important. Um, the reason why it's important, I think, is more telling. When we first designed the tool, um, we were expecting to flood counties um, with clients that we were not so sure yet how they would be able to serve effectively given the under-resourced environment that, that they exist in. But one of the key items that we noticed through our user research um, and through working in close partnership with our partners in government is that it was the communication feedback loops that were really, really key in actually driving efficiencies and driving down processing time within the product. Um, so our next steps, you know, this is an ongoing project. What we'd really like to do is to scale outward within California to serve the full state um, so that someone within the entire state of California could actually, if you imagine having convictions across all of the counties, be able to do so in one place in under 10 minutes. Um, but how we're thinking about doing this at Code for America, I'm sure anyone who's heard a talk given by one of us has seen this graphic before. Um, but I think some of the key lessons that m might not be you know, incredibly novel to this room but are worth restating um, for us is really understand the problem. Um, we work really in close collaboration with government to help us do that. They understand the system. In many cases, they understand the target audiences that we're trying to serve. Um, again, begin and end with the user. So starting to have conversations and collect data based on user needs has been really critical for helping us to understand what our next feature deployment should be and how to continually improve the product. And then the last thing I'll say is to just move quickly. Um, so we file an agile development process where we work quickly to get a minimal viable product in front of users as soon as possible and to use user data to drive um, changes um, through the product throughout the process. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some of the other pr projects um, by my fellow panelists and to begin to have a discussion around what are some other lessons or key ingredients or practices that we can learn for um, driving successful projects um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And our second speaker uh, is from France, uh, Ms. Uh, Mathilde, Mathilde Brass. <laughs> Please. And uh, he is currently the Open Government Officers uh, in uh, ATLAB. Uh, which is uh, under uh, the authorization of uh, Prime Minister. And uh, uh, civil tech is one of the main topic of the Paris uh, uh, summit. So there, there's welcome, uh, Ms. Uh, Bras. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your attention at the end of the day. I know for some of us, it's quite difficult to be awake. <laughs> Um, so, I, my name is Mathilde and I work at Etalab, which is the French government task force for open data, open gov, and data sciences. Um, when we started preparing this panel, to me it was difficult to identify the scope of uh, government-led uh, civic technology, uh, because uh, as an open gov officer we have a lot of initiatives, and, and also to, to define what, what is uh, civic tech for government is quite difficult because, in my opinion, uh, it has to focus on citizen interest and also on uh, public action transformation. So that's why I've, um, I've suggested that we talk about GovTech, uh, which is something that 
uh, was uh, first uh, mentioned by the OECD, and I think it's it's quite an interesting concept, and it has to be uh, worked a little bit more. But it would help. It, it will help me um, um, present you some of the ch challenges that we have in France uh, in terms of stru structuring an ecosystem of uh, of civic tech actors, and also um, building on. Uh, our digital resources as an administration in order to innovate and create new digital services. So one of the most emblematic initiatives that uh, can relate to GovTech and civic tech in government uh, is uh, the Digital Republic Bill, uh, which was um, the first uh, open legislation process uh, initiated in 2015, where the French ministry, Minister for uh, Digital Affairs decided to put a draft bill on an online platform so that citizens could uh, put amendments and uh, suggest modification to the bill. Um, in terms of success, uh, it was because the bill was passed at the end of the process and some of the contributions uh, made by citizens became some rules and articles in a law. Um, one of the key challenges to me for, for GovTech is the feedback loop. How you get, uh, as a citizen, the feedback that you need, that your contribution was something that was useful and impactful. Um, and one, one other challenge, which is not maybe visible in, in civic tech uh, initiatives, is uh, to train publics and civil, and civil uh, servants to these new processes. And we talked about digital literacy inclusion for the public, but also for uh, public officers. Uh, it's, it's also a change because it's not root into the culture of government to contribute on an online platform. Uh, and so this, this work uh, was quite hard. Uh, and you had to, we had to find some allies into the government and the administration uh, because we were expecting them uh, to respond to some contribution on some articles or to, to maybe just give some advice or, or say, this is not possible, you should answer this and this. And this was, this was my main challenge. And to try cope with this challenge, uh, after the OGP summit, uh, we, we decided to build a platform uh, to help administration and public agency uh, build consultation uh, easily. And so I think one of the main uh, learn lesson is that when you build something on your own without taking the ecosystem into account, you, you will fail. So that's why we, we decided to, to include a lot of civic tech actors that some of them are in the room uh, to, uh, to put their tools into this online platform and label the tools so that the government and the administration uh, trust the tool and can use them easily. So it's still a beta project. Uh, some of the use cases uh, are also telling us uh, how, to, how to transform uh, this project and how to make it more scalable. Um, but uh, our hope is that this becomes something where the government and the administration uh, can multiply uh, consultation. Uh, so this is the, this emblematic use case. I have other ones, but I, I will just focus on two, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I will focus on this. Uh, so at Etalab, we also build tools uh, based on open data and data that we have as a public agency. And uh, one of the, I think, the, the most uh, impactful and interesting is OpenFISCA, which is uh, a platform to compute models in terms of tax and benefits. Uh, so we take uh, some data and some code from the, from the taxation policy and benefit policy and try to and help researchers or public actors to imagine new models and new legislation processes to be more to be fair or to be uh, just new models. And based on this uh, application, uh, some people from uh, the Prime Minister team built uh, what I think a very impactful tool, which is called MEZ. Uh, and so it uses the data to improve um, the access of social benefits. So for instance, if you need a 
some uh, help to finance your housing. You, you can just simulate your rights and talk about your situation uh, and uh, calculate and identify which benefits and which help you can, uh, you can have from the government. Um, and so just to conclude and to open the discussion to others, uh, I would say that what's important uh, when in government you're trying to, to lead uh, some civic tech initiatives, uh, somehow we need to find standards in order to have impact on citizens and to build also trust with the public officers that are going to be transformed also by these initiatives. And so I put some of them just as ideas uh, and maybe there are others, maybe we need to um, develop some of them, but um, uh, in, uh, in our, in our um, spirit and philosophy at Etalab, we think that everything should be open by design, accessible and inclusive, uh, include several levels of governance, so the local, civil society, even private pa partners if it's uh, necessary. It should be impact-oriented and be fair and transparent, drive innovation in the public sector, and built with the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mathilde. Uh, our third uh, speaker, uh, Shu Yang Ling, uh, is also from government in Taiwan. And currently, she is working with uh, Minister uh, Audrey Tang. And as I know, you are engaged in a lot of very uh, uh, very interesting uh, government-led project. So let us welcome uh, Su Yang to share with us. Okay. So hi, I'm Su Yang um, from here. Um, really happy to be here and um, be able to share with you one of the projects we are working on. Um, the Rearchitect of Pilis um, stands for Public Digital Innovation Space. And uh, Rearchitect, uh, the title is quite uh, new, so that everyone actually asked me why uh, this name, who, who made that name for you, who made that title for you. So I, I was like, well, I'm trying to rearchitect the, 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 the culture in our team and the culture overall in the government, so not from scratch, but um, starting from what exists already in the government and uh, trying to do this a little bit of rearchitecting. Um, so I'll show one of the projects we made in Pilis. Um, it's called Participation Officers. It's, uh, it's actually not a project, it's essentially um, 20 projects with 70 people in a team. Um, it started from um, last year when, uh, when I joined Pilis from last October. We decided to um, we decided that we want to have a team, the core team we can, we can collaborate with in the government who are um, probably existing um, public servants already who know what to do in the government already. So we started from sending a letter uh, to the government and uh, in, in, in the government and also on the internet by BB, BBS or uh, PPT, PTT. Um, um, and uh, the, the letter trend travel quite fast and many people uh, got aware of that and some we got some volunteers in the end and in the end we got like uh, 70 uh, public servants volunteer to work with us so it was quite uh, I was quite amazed and quite uh, happy that we do uh, when we say we wanted to have some passionate public servants and people did raise their hand and join us and so if I can um, picture a bit what uh, public participation officers or POs will do in a day. Uh, they will start from working collaboratively within um, um, their belonging ministries and always trying to discover opportunities um, that could be done uh, in the future or, or could, be, uh, could be collaborated with other people, uh, um, probably within the ministry or with other ministries as well. And if there are chances, uh, we do encourage them to um, call for a request or call for a collaboration with other ministries as well. So one PO in one ministry might try to call for a request with another uh, PO in another ministry and probably will be more interesting than more, more ministries than, than one. So one of the example uh, we uh, went through this summer is a case in Hanchuan. 
And it's a, Hanchuan is a southeast part of Taiwan where in that time, some citizens in Hanchuan Lei um, started a petition and saying that um, we're in lack of medical resources and we do want to have um, more, um, probably more doctors in town and more hospital facilities in town. And they were being really creative that they were re requesting in the petition that um, they wanted to have a national helicopter helicopter um, to be stationed in Hanchen so that they could um, serve as ambulance um, and try to uh, help trans transport uh, patients if, if, it, if it's needed. So um, that time we got we, we, we got this petition and um, the PO in minute uh, in uh, Department of uh, of uh, Interior uh, found out, and she uh, talked to us in police and said, maybe we can have a collaboration workshop. Maybe we can talk to the local people as well, and think and to kind of understand what is the real need they they are asking for. Um, so we went on and uh, organized this uh, collaboration workshop in Hanchuan directly. We went to the southern part of Taiwan and organized a, a workshop that has around 40 people with a lot of um, stakeholders from different backgrounds, including head of local, doc local hospitals, um, including um, officials from different ministries, um, from Ministry of uh, Interior, of, of course, and Ministry of Transportation and Ministry of uh, uh, Health and Welfare. Um, and in the end, um, we found out that, um, of course, the, co the, the direct solution is to make the hospital better, to uh, kind of inject more resources to a hospital. Um, but also, there could be other proposals, uh, like really looking into having helicopters, helicopters in a town. But uh, to fix that, um, because if, if we call for a hel helicopter for transport of patients, it might take more time, actually. Uh, compared to calling uh, an ambulance from another city. So if, if we want to look at that proposal uh, deeply, we might need to uh, fast, fast up um, the paperwork or application process, uh, time, of, time for application process. So um, th th there's another solution that could be uh, done by uh, improving the infrastructure of uh, transportation, meaning probably fix a highway um, from another city to the local town in Hanchen. And for us, it was um, quite a success successful case in the end because, well, in the end, um, uh, the, the ministry decided to put more resources and budgets to, to, to Hanchen and improve the facilities in, in the local hospital. But also not, be, not, not only because the end was really successful, we, I think uh, the process was really interesting because it was a very uh, close, ministry uh, collaboration. Um, many people from different places, including um, the general public, including government officials, um, but also ministries um, uh, inside the executive department in Taiwan. In, in before, they, it might be really difficult for uh, ministries to collaborate with each other, but in this case, um, we, we see three ministries uh, collaborate with each other. So I think that's quite, um, I was quite impressed on that. And the petition were reacted really rapidly, and um, you can see a trust built um, between the local citizens and uh, the government officials. So it was quite nice to first time really seeing, like from my point of view, first time seeing not only the government is showing the trust to people, but also the people, the local citizens is showing the trust to the government, listening them and collaborate and putting ideas into a collaboration workshop. And uh, during the workshop, the discussion was quite amazing as well. Um, one of the organizers of this workshop is also sitting here in the audience. I think she did a really good job. And um, not only by looking at what the citizens proposed, but also really think about why they proposed this kind of uh, question, problem, or even an idea proposal, and looking into the reason why they proposed that, and try to uh, use the design thinking method to find out more proposal or ideas from, from, from that. So that was quite interesting, and in the end, uh, this case, um, um, did, well, on the tool side, on the tool set side, we also um, live stream and recorded the entire process. So people 
everywhere, basically in the world, uh, not only in Taiwan, can understand and see the entire process. It's quite transparent. And so I'll just talk a little bit more about the structure of PO network. Um, we uh, gather weekly and monthly and quality base. And weekly, we do have this collabor collaboration workshop, uh, weekly base, um, where we usually pick up, um, uh, we usually select or pick one of the petitions that pass through uh, 5,000 uh, people in the join.gov.tw website. And uh, in a monthly basis, the POs will gather again together to think about uh, how PO network works. So they do have a say on how this system should work. Um, and in quarterly basis, we um, present the, the, the quarterly result uh, to the, the head of ministries. And the PO system, the PO network uh, sits in um, the cent I think it's just the center of open government thing, uh, especially collaborating with um, different departments in executive department. And we report directly to, to the premier of Taiwan. And uh, it's facilitated, facilitated by PDs, that's our team, and to try to help them going, uh, going through this, using design thinking process to solve different kinds of controversial issues in Taiwan. Um, so, yeah, so there, there are some challenges um, uh, after we've done like 20 times of collaboration workshops. Uh, we do see some challenges. For example, um, the POs could, could um, be more actively proposing ideas or requesting for help um, to other POs or to PDs. Or the s skill development they can do. Maybe they can, uh, in the beginning we, do, we did ask for people who are more into um, probably open for learning the value of open government or uh, who are good at communication, who are good in public relations. Um, but not, not so many of them has all the skills. So we do think it's important to keep training and keep having these kind of conversion workshops so that people can go through a process again and again and practice on, um, for example, communication, translation, and uh, deliberation skills. And the third one, the third challenge is we C is um, because we do only organize this workshop every uh, once a week. So the capacity we have uh, every month is three to four workshops. Uh, it could be more, but we, we could do more, but uh, uh, we, do have, we do need more people uh, to facilitate it. So um, I think this workshop is quite, it's very worthwhile to, to, um, to increase this its capacity, but also the quality of workshops is really important. So we started from uh, small and few now, but we do want to uh, kind of have this impact um, to all the POs and probably one day they can organize their own workshops inside their ministries as well. And the last challenge we see is to, um, is that building the trust, um, no matter between the government uh, and the social society, or between the ministries in, inside the government, uh, all takes time. So uh, what we can do now, when I say it, what we can do now is just to keep doing it, keep working on it, keep well, organizing workshops and keep people from different um, backgrounds, keep all the stakeholders uh, talking and communicate to each other. So the last uh, few slides, last two slides, I'll, I'll talk about how this uh, PO network um, use different kinds of digital tools uh, to really implement the open government for pillar that is transparency, participation, accountability, and inclusion. Um, so it's basically a lot of uh, live streaming videos. So we do whatever we do, we do um, record and live stream the entire process, and most of them, well, all of them were uh, full transcript, and most of them were live streamed. So this, this has a very crucial, crucial um, role to implement all these four uh, elements. Um, I think live streaming videos makes um, the, the, pro the process or the work in our government more transparent um, because people can always get online and look at what we are doing and what people are talking about. People can participate because there's always a chat room or chat channel next to the video. 
Uh, you can also uh, ask questions on another platform called Slido that we open every time. And there's another online tool called Real Time Boards we use for mapping our uh, mind map or mind system and telling people what we are thinking about and how we break this this uh, topic into piece and piece and, um, and uh, how we bring some ideas uh, according to that. And uh, it's accountable because um, the videos were recorded, of course, and uh, you have a searchable for transcript. Um, and in the end, um, we do want to include as many people as possible on, on this conversation, but the, r the size of the room is very limited. So maybe every time the number of partic participants will be uh, confined by the, the, the size of the room. But when the video is recorded and live streamed uh, on the internet, everybody can join and participate and could be included in the conversation. Um, so yeah, and also with Slido and real-time board's help, you can have a more better understanding of what is happening inside the uh, collaboration workshop. So that gives the end of my presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shu Yang. Our last speaker uh, is from Amsterdam. And uh, Thomas uh, Acklins uh, currently is a program manager of uh, data innovation for uh, the city of Amsterdam. Uh, so let us welcome uh, Thomas. I hope, it's, I hope it's tall enough now. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's me. I'm just being too tall. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for uh, for having having me here, um, being part of the Code for All network. Uh, so if you're a local developer here and you want to learn more about uh, what the Code for Network is doing, um, maybe it's good to to see some hands. Who is here part of the Code for All movement? Yeah, I see I see here about ten people. 15, 20 people there. So if you're a local developer and you want to know uh, something about how uh, our developers in other countries trying to create this open source movement, please come to one of these people. I think a lot of these people are also coming tonight to the, the Google building. Uh, I'll also be there. Uh, so, so if you want to know more about Amsterdam, uh, we're happy to, to share uh, all our, our, uh, our cases here. And I'm happy to learn uh, from yours. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my job as a program manager of, of Amsterdam uh, Data Innovation and the transition we've made from citizen-led uh, innovation to more government-led innovation, at least. Uh, that's, that's what we try to do. And I think government-led maybe is the wrong term. I would say government-facilitated because uh, uh, it starts with an open mind uh, of the government officials that uh, they don't have the truth in their hands. Uh, me, even as a government official, uh, I'm serving the people. So it starts with an attitude of serving the people. Then you need uh, the, uh, the right data as an ingredient and the right open source software uh, to create something with it. I have a case I'm demonstrating about the crowded city, a typical Amsterdam problem, uh, and some open source, source uh, software that uh, we want to share with all of you. So it starts with this. With this. These are all Amsterdam folks. Um, the goal is to improve the quality of life of these people. Uh, this is ba the goal of the, the government. It's not to be risk a a a averse, uh, as is a more traditional way of thinking about government, or to, uh, to make sure that your politician doesn't make an error or your politician is, is doing uh, a great job. Of course, that's important, but it's not about uh, uh, serving a politician. It's about serving the people uh, as a public servant. So as the government, uh, we feel we cannot do that uh, by ourselves uh, to, to improve the quality of life of our citizens. We are just a facilitator. Uh, we have a neutral position, thereby we, we can have a central role in bringing together different actors in this network. An important actor here is the WAC Society, who is also here, so Kuhn is there. Um, it is a great innovative space in which there's lots of experimentation, uh, makers, maker lab, uh, uh, virtual reality, all this kind of experimental stuff, blockchain. They're, they're testing it out first there, and it's uh, uh, citizen science. They're also uh, very strong on that. Um, and therefore, we, are, we were uh, rewarded uh, for, uh, by the European Commission, actually, to be, to be the most innovative city of Europe. Uh, so we're really proud of that, 2016, 2017. 
Um, uh, so it's a joint effort of all these partners in the network, not by the city government. Um, so uh, the question is, if you have this kind of attitude and you're, uh, uh, yeah, basically you're arguing that this, this open mind is important, what do you do when you win uh, uh, 1 million euros? Because uh, that's, that's the thing. Uh, we doubled the amount and we asked the uh, good initiatives in the city who are already going on uh, to apply for funding. So rather than putting fun put funding into a new pilot project, we wanted to, uh, to, to support the existing community and the in innovation community. So another way to open up as a government is how can you be open to uh, young entre entrepreneurs who want to start up a business? So rather than thinking that we have the end solution in mind as the government, um, we have to think more agile. So we set up uh, the, the startup program in which uh, we uh, pose challenges for startups to answer to. So for example, challenge would be mobility or circular economy kind of challenges. So there was even a guy who invented a machine uh, who uh, converted uh, uh, bio waste uh, uh, to, uh, fos to fuels. So bio waste to, to fuels, which is uh, something that was uh, supported by the government and is now being implemented in the, the Vondel Park, one of our uh, biggest parks. So we have uh, quite some experience with open data. We were the first uh, in Europe to start an open data program in 2011. Um, and yeah, we've learned some lessons there that uh, I'd be happy to share with you. And we basically, uh, in this movement from more citizen-centered uh, citizen innovation to more government-facilitated innovation, open data was crucial. The, the uh, expectations of open data in 2011 were huge. Uh, uh, basically, there were seminars with, with business people like that saying, we we're opening the data, and four hours later, a magic app was created. <laughs> As if all this... Uh, the developer community, of course, they are amazing, but to create an application in four hours uh, that has a business value of, of a million euros, uh, that's a bit unrealistic. So <laughs> um, that, that's why uh, of, of, at the beginning, some lessons were to be made, uh, that open data is not a goal as such, and we tried to set up uh, this, this data innovation program, which is more about partnerships. So we have three layers. Um, we want to open up data internally. One of the lessons that we found was that um, when we opened up data, uh, people within the government said, hey, that's great. I can finally see the, the, the data of my colleague at a different department. Uh, so uh, this way, I think the, the biggest business case in open data is in opening in data within an organization and improving the data quality. So that's one of the lessons. The second lesson was to share data with, with uh, uh, companies or uh, universities or, or civil society, at least with organizations who have a common interest in solving a problem. So for example, an energy company like, like Nuon has the same interest uh, because they want to, to uh, transform their business to a more, uh, um, yeah, a more sustainable business model rather than based on, uh, on fossil fuels. And, and open data, of course, is also uh, still very important. So to highlight uh, this, uh, I have a case um, which encompasses uh, mostly open data, but also an open mind. Uh, I don't think you can read it very well, but uh, it is, this case is about uh, the crowded city of Amsterdam. So who have you actually been to Amsterdam? See some hands? Well, that's, that's a lot. See? <laughs> Uh, and the, the people, the visitors coming to Amsterdam uh, are increasing 20% every year. So 20% uh, more visitors every year, that's a lot. And because we have a very historical uh, center. I just told my, my other panelist, I, uh, I've been a tour guide um, uh, when I was a, a high school uh, student and I was, when I was a student. Uh, and back then, uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, people were really happy with tourists. But right now, it's changing. So you see the city is commercializing a lot. Um, and uh, citizens uh, get annoyed with, with tourism. Um, not with tourists, but with tourism as a commercial. <laughs> so you're still very welcome to come <laughs> um, as a commercial activity. So how can you solve a problem like that using uh, data, using uh, uh, an open mind? Well, there, we did a number of things. But one of the things uh, uh, was to go to the people and to ask them, so, okay, 
we know you're annoyed with tourism, with uh, commercialism, but what is it that you're actually so annoyed with? What is the real problem here? Um, and we asked the, the, the most uh, loud, the loudest uh, complainers uh, the, on Twitter uh, to the city government, who basically hate the, the city government, uh, to uh, give us a tour to the city. So we just followed these complaining citizens and, and um, we experienced how it was uh, to think ab about tourism this way. And uh, then we, uh, we asked them to uh, voice their concerns on a specific location on the map. So that from this huge problem that every, everything sucks, uh, it became tangible and we could solve a part of it. Because <laughs> you cannot solve a big, big problem like that at once. You can solve a part of it and then hopefully scale it up. So you see here, this is a, a, a one of the locations that got three uh, yeah, three stickers, and we wanted to, to solve something there uh, and solve the location there. And so we made some, some changes to the public space, but also we got this idea of, okay, maybe we should know as a government how many people are where at which moment uh, uh, in history, real time, and in the future. Because if we know this basic set of information, then we can also direct our city services and make it more data-driven. Our cleaning people, they can clean the street when it is needed. Our, 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 our traffic signs, they can turn on and off when there are more or less people. So to make our, our basic city operations more data-driven, we need this basic model uh, of crowdedness. So that's what we're creating now. And we set up a hackathon and some, some developers of uh, booking.com were also there. Uh, this is one of the uh, private partners, and they uh, had this open source algorithm counting the number of people that worked surprisingly well on open cameras. Uh, so using that, uh, we already had lots of, uh, uh, of sources for this model. So now we're taking it a step further, and I'm doing uh, pizza nights uh, every two weeks with these developers to take it a step further. So from hackathon to more like implementation level, um, which is uh, quite challenging. As a government, I don't ask the politician if I can do that, I just do it. And uh, uh, the politician is, is actually really happy with uh, uh, a more connection to the, the citizen in the end. But to the, the, the medium management level, uh, I'm having lots of arguments with. <laughs> so that's also what you find uh, in government. So the last case is the, um, the data.amsterdam.nl, a big, big, big data re re repository. Uh, that is open source and all available on GitHub. So if you're a city or if you want to create a more continuous delivery uh, platform, uh, our data point is openly available and we're very help happy to help you uh, using it. Um, and it's made, it's really state of the art uh, uh, technology uh, because there's a team behind of about th 30 people who has worked in, um, in private sector before, mostly independent people. Uh, but with uh, with the heart uh, of the of, with the civic tech uh, mindset and heart uh, behind, so it's uh, it's good stuff. Uh, so right, we're scaling up now um, to, uh, to to a, a bigger innovation effort, uh, facil facilitating the community and and hiring more developers uh, internally to circumvent uh, procurement uh, laws. So this is uh, yeah some of the an example of the data point. Okay, so thank you, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Thomas uh, well, yes, and I, I have one question. Uh, because in the early years, uh, most of the civil tech uh, uh, projects initiated by uh, civic society, and recently uh, is uh, getting more and more uh, projects uh, initiated by government. So what is the difference between uh, these two, uh, two ways? For example, uh, if they involve uh, uh, the payment issues, you know, as I know, uh, most of the civil, uh, civil tech initiated by uh, civil society, the government doesn't pay, right? Am I right? I don't know. Maybe maybe Sarah can answer the questions. And if the project initiated by government, uh, normally government should pay, will pay, right? So is that the differences? And that's the uh, payment issues. And is that, uh, if uh, 
one thing initiated by government where that involve uh, any procurement issues and with 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 it cost so called the efficiency uh, of the uh, implementation of the civil tech so uh, any any of you can answer this question I can start um, so you're you're right um, with code for America um, particularly at the beginning of our founding of our organization, um, we were partnering um, with private um, foundations and individuals to actually fund um, what turns out to be often proof of concept work, um, early stage pilots, prototypes, um, whatever you want to call them, um, starting at a, a small scale with local government and then building outward. Um, we have um, kind of a slogan we call this now, it's called bottoms up and outside in. So working at the local level, um, but in very close collaboration with government um, to demonstrate our impact and the potential of this work. Um, what we're beginning to see is that working in this way, we start to see government engage in terms of um, positioning us for contracts and other opportunities. Um, but it's been, I think, a slow progression and one that we will be continuing to explore in other work. Um, I think the procurement question is a tough one, and I will definitely leave that to some of my folks that are working in government um, to try and tackle that question, but thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the issue is broader than payment. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a question of culture, uh, if a government is ready to uh, to interact and to build projects with some civil society organization or with some company, uh, it, it he can do it. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, we have rules, but we can also innovate on those rules. Uh, and for instance, on the project that I showed you on the public consultation. Um, the, the state has to be fair and 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 uh, equal, but when we talked with actors, uh, we asked them to respect some criteria, and if they are respecting them, when they want to develop services, paid services, um, they will be referenced and labeled on a public procurement platform, so that we don't have to wait for public procurement rules. It's, a, it's a, like a common platform. So we can find some ways to avoid, um, to avoid uh, losing time or effic efficiency. Um, and also, I think, on the, there's a procurement side to collaborate with some private actors, but there's also the HR side, uh, because um, when you build a GovTech or civic tech uh, initiative, you need some people to maintain, to develop, to deploy. Uh, and it's also a challenge for government to attract those talents because um, we also have rules and, and limits in terms of payment. Uh, so that's why we also need to find new ways to attract these people. Uh, and this is uh, what we are trying to do with a, an initiative called Public Interest Entrepreneurs, uh, which is inspired from the um, Presidential Innovation Fellows in the US, uh, and where we are selecting some, some government projects to be uh, led and uh, taken by some outside entrepreneurs, which uh, we are paying differently than the normal rules. And this, this gave us some work to do because we had to convince a lot of authorities and agencies that uh, to allow us doing this project. Um, but it shows that to drive cultural change, you have to innovate on the rules, um, and you have to test new rules as well. And I think that's why uh, the procurement issue that you've raised is, is really, it is, is more general than civic tech. It's, it's about innovating uh, in the public sector. And I, I hope that we'll find some stable and uh, sustainable rules for that. Oh, right. Um, so I do agree with um, Mathilde that um, it's border than 
just the, um, the payment issue. Um, well, I, I do think um, government-led and um, civic-led projects are very different, but, um, but I, also, I also believe that we want it to be almost the same, almost very similar, because we, I, I think it should be a um, um, collaboration uh, relationship instead of a substitution one. That, uh, yes, <laughs> it's nice to, to hear that. Because um, no matter it's led by government or led by uh, civil society, uh, it should be a collaboration project um, from uh, us all in the in a entire society. In the end, the government officials will be civil, civil will be people living in the society as well. So uh, I think it should be a broader image or a dream that uh, us all in the society we move on projects together and try to create a, a future. Uh, all together, but at the current status now, um, when I present the PO network, um, the challenges will be very clearly from uh, the trust from the citizens. If people are encouraged enough to to trust, uh, to trust the government, to trust their work, to trust the the workshop organized by a government, if you are willing to participate in one of the workshops like that. Uh, we do see people slowly joining the workshop and probably the quality of workshop will be very different um, because we have not in, enough people to work on the design, work on the program uh, management or program design of these workshops. Um, but, uh, well, I just kind of trying to believe that in the end, as long as we keep doing all that, keep um, getting our experience, we'll get more, more, more trust from, from, from the people. Um, another point of view about trust is also um, when somebody asks us that, um, so we know there should be trust, and there should be trust between the government and society, and who, who should provide the trust first? The government should um, take the hands uh, first, reach out to society or, or otherwise. And I think the, the answer is always the government. It's always the government should uh, trust the people first so that people can return the trust back. Um, but for, for another question, that what is the problem for um, civic society-led uh, innovations? I think it's more about the commitment of government. That many times we see um, people are really creative and did a lot of creative things and ideas, and sometimes uh, government just didn't put a budget inside, um, and that's very frustrating. And you do see frustrations when the commitment of government is really, 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 really uh, not enough. So. I think one of the good examples we did, if you know Vita One well, um, it's a playful consultation process that also proposed by Jacqueline Tsai um, in one of the hackathons in GovZero community. Um, but, but, but I want to point out that the very interesting thing about Vita One is every project, every case we launch on Vita One has to uh, launch with a requirement that both the government side and both the com and the community side are committed to this case, and that's how everything started. So I think that kind of close up, uh, close the idea of, um, yeah, kind of gave me the dream of this platform should be work uh, co co collaboratively uh, by the government and the society. Yeah, so about, uh the issue of procurement, I think uh, uh, we as government need legal, uh, legal officers that are creative because lots of uh, things are possible if you look at the goals of the law rather than uh, having a risk adverse uh, interpretation of it that you find a lot. Uh, but we have one star legal officer that has made lots of, st lots of stuff uh, possible. So I hope we get more of, of the, her kind of uh, people uh, because I think that can make a big difference within the government. Um, so one thing that feels a bit unfair is that we're hiring all these developers and then we're also uh, setting up challenges for uh, uh, committed individuals to work with us uh, volunteering and we don't pay them. So as a government, I, f I feel a bit uh, awkward sometimes doing that. Um, but if I ask them, uh, do you want to work for us? Then usually it's like, no, I already got paid uh, two or three times as much in the private sector. I just want to do something good in, in my spare time. Uh, which makes sense. Uh, so, uh, we d I think it's also a durable model uh, because myself, I also have the experience in the private sector and I know that uh, it can give you some bad karma, 
So uh, I hope <laughs> we give people some good karma with uh, uh, making them work uh, on, uh, uh, on tech for good uh, uh, challenges. Uh, so that's also the, th the, the thing that we as governments, uh, we have to be aware that we can offer that to uh, committed individuals who having an, are having a, a mission. Um, so I think there, there's lots of opportunities in, in these issues you raised and um, the, the, what we should be careful of is that when we hire developers that they won't be uh, like uh, public servants. Um, so we have to maintain the developer culture there. So you have need strong team values uh, to, uh, for example, to make sure that uh, they're not listening to any government official who wants a dashboard, but they're trying to find a real solution. Thank you. Uh, yeah, questions. So we, we have to open the discussion to, uh, to the floor. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, so I have a question, but it's from mostly from the uh, from point of view of Pakistan. So, like how my government works. Uh, one of the problem uh, that I see, uh, I work for Core for Pakistan, so we work with government uh, a lot. Uh, the decision makers in government, they are literally those people who are at their retiring age. So, in those that that time where they are about to retire in a year or two, they don't want to do things which are risky because accountability board on those kind of people then can come after them even if they are doing something right but not as per books because the, the yeah because it was not in the regulatory uh, procedure whatever ways are there so do you guys face certain issues, such type of issues in your country where unless there is a political will the decision maker in bureaucracy are not really uh, helping civil society do the right thing especially when it comes to civil tech organizations or um, if you want me to further elaborate an example, I can give you one, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, so. We have, um, I can say, um, that's, yes, that's absolutely an obstacle. Um, in my role as a partnerships manager, you know, I'm in charge of cultivating and, and soliciting relationships with new governments in hopes that they'll want to use our product. And they don't always want to because they're afraid of um, new things, they're risk averse, um, and the criminal justice system particularly. Um, I think one thing that um, our organization has fallen back on is again that, that user research and user data. Um, being, I think, an outsider to government, the, the red flags for risk probably go off even higher um, for those within government and being able to speak to what users are demanding or lacking um, within a specific service can actually help, I think, in my experience, to open doors um, for your work. Um, and to, instead of coming in as an outsider, you know, as a technologist, as, as someone that is perceived to be risky, um, or coming in, you know, with even a worse, I think, image of, of having some kind of savior complex representing user data and users themselves um, and letting that information speak, um, I found to be effective. Um, that's just one suggestion I have. I don't know if others um, want to chime in. Yeah, okay, so there's, there's an advice here. Uh, it was just, I just, just do it. Just create something. Uh, do the thing that you uh, think is, is the right thing and uh, demonstrate what you can create. And I think this is the, uh, the, the way forward. And uh, also a very interesting point made by, by Sarah is how they're selling basically their solutions. And then the, the government can still choose the risk averse uh, uh, option, but it will fail anyway. So <laughs> then, then your uh, solution will be there uh, to be used and uh, find the right uh, persons to, to convince and find, it, uh, find the politicians uh, because the politicians are more eager to listen to you than the, the bureaucrats. Okay, last question.
Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, did, did you think about getting some big companies to actually pay for the developers? Like, I don't know, Google, for instance, who is hosting the event tonight. Uh, they could be paying development of, of uh, government programs. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea, actually. Um, we are working together with Google on a, a, a Better Cities program uh, in which the people from Google uh, create uh, solutions and also uh, change also applications from Google's, Google to make it more uh, to serve uh, public goals. Um, so, I, but I think we can do that a lot more and I think it's a great business model in this world in which everyone needs to, to have a mission and in which the corporate uh, world is, isn't providing this mission uh, uh, and they're in a war for talent of data scientists. So I think we as public sector or, or, or civic tech people can exploit that much more. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, in brief, uh, even for government-led uh, project, uh, government have to be a platform, invite the public uh, to contribute, uh, that everyone can help the government work better. So thank you. Uh, for the for the uh, for joining us and thank you for all the speakers sh uh, sharing.